Lucky. I am the director of the Outdoor Leadership and Adventure Education Program here at Garrett College. Tonight's presentation is part of the Joan Crawford Lecture Series, and it's also a piece of our 30-year reunion, 30-year anniversary reunion for our Outdoor Leadership Program, formerly uh, the Adventure Sports Institute. Tonight we have Greg Corio. He's a graduate of the program from 1999, mm -hmm. and he's going to be talking to us about his efforts to improve lives in the state of West Virginia through outdoor recreation. So I'll turn it over All to right. Greg. Thanks, Andy. Can you hear me okay? How's that sound? <laughs> hey, Steve. It's so nice that they built this auditorium just for this event. And uh, I was so excited. I was the 15th water bottle that was out of the water bottle filler over there. This is so, so wonderful to be back on campus and to see all of you. This campus, this degree program really set off my entire career. So, hey Mike, how are you? And uh, it's really an honor to be back here. And um, in true Garrett fashion, I slept in my car last night at Snowshoe <laughs> with my son uh, over here on the corner. Spent the day mountain biking and got here in time, got cleaned up to, to be here this evening. So sorry I missed last night's uh, activities. And so um, what I want to share is, um, you know, I grew up in West Virginia. I came here when I wanted to get into outdoor education. But over the years, I wanted to, how can we change the state? West Virginia is always 48th, 49th. We just got ranked the most obese state in the country. We're always at the bottom of all the wrong, right lists and the top of all the wrong lists. But when you talk to people in the outdoor recreation field, the people that are climbing at Seneca or paddling down the rivers, the place is absolutely amazing. And so um, I'm going to talk about within the six months of our new office, we got the largest gift in WVU history, $25 million, how we've raised $3.6 million to get kids outside. But all of that started here. And so a seed at this college. So I want to tell you, um, run this through with you, and I have some old photos. <laughs> and so, um, Steve, we're teaching you backcountry living skills. I think I was your TA uh, up on North Fork Mountain. Yep, there's no water up there. Um, very dry. Um, helped lead the, the Moab trip. Um, and, uh, but I was, I was in a class and I had to teach something. And uh, during spring break, I took my woofer course, first time taking woofer. I went out to Swallow Falls and went ice climbing for the first time. And I'm like, this is heaven. Incredibly beautiful, it's nighttime because we were out there climbing. And I'm like, I want to do this. So I was in a class with Steve Tome and uh, he was like, uh, you, you've got to teach something. I'm like, I'm going to make a climbing hold. My, my best friend and I, had our little business that we'd make climbing holds, glow-in-the-dark climbing holds in the, in the 90s, and we paid for a trip to Yosemite. And I said, I'm going to make a climbing hold that has a pick placement, because if you follow someone who climbs, they pull out their ice axe, there's a little hole there. And Steve said, well, you'll make millions if you could come up with something you could swing into. And I'm just here to say that they, he lied to me. <laughs> I did not make millions. Um, but. Uh, I went back and I started thinking about it. And I laid in my, in my uh, apartment room out on Sang Run Road, and I was living with Jay and Joe, and I forget the other guy's name. Uh, uh, anyways, I came up with the idea to put an archery target on a climbing wall. And so, and this is at the 2000 Outdoor Retailer Show, so I invented it, sold it to a company in Oregon, Entree Prix, and they debuted it in 2000. So, <laughs> What that did for me as a student was said, you could take these crazy ideas, right? I'm gonna put an archery target on a climbing wall and I'm gonna sell it to a company in Oregon. And they did it. And it's used and, and some of the top ice climbers in the world use it. They use it at every retailer show. There's a big facility up in Seattle. They teach people how to use crampons with it. But that was started in the gymnasium, which I think was right here or just over. Yeah, this whole idea for me. Here's, here's the brochure from the dry ice uh, that Andre Priest sold. So all of that started here, but that, that really gave me the boost and the confidence that you can take crazy ideas that will give you $25 million to try to start changing the state. And I don't think that would have happened. But Steve, I did not make millions of dollars. <laughs> you, 
seriously, come on. I was counting on that. So uh, I had such a great time here, and it really gave me the foundation in outdoor education that really spanned my whole career at, at WVU. I've been at WVU 19 years. My son is also over here, and so here's a picture from today, uh, riding a snowshoe. And uh, in 2018, when he was in third grade, he backpacked the Grand Canyon rim to rim. So, it's a pretty big feat for a third grader. All right, so the Brad and Lisa Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative. Brad Smith, I didn't know who he was. I probably should have done research on him before I met him. Um, he was the third highest ranked CEO in Silicon Valley in 2018. He did not go to WVU. Um, but he was also sitting out in California in Silicon Valley and got an offer to, he was the CEO of Intuit. Um, I don't know how much he's worth, um, but he's incredibly kind. He's, he's a graduate from Marshall University. He's currently their president. And when he, we shared with him some of the data you're gonna see today, from day one he was in for $25 million in how do we change this state. And he's uh, friends with uh, Jennifer Gardner, he works with her, he works with uh, John Chambers, who was the CEO of, of uh, Cisco when they were building the internet, he's a billionaire, and they all are trying to collaborate in how do we help change a state. I think outdoor recreation is the future of West Virginia. And so the vision, so here are two pictures of me climbing, so the Swallow Falls, and the other one's in New Zealand on the South Island at Abel Tasman National Park. So that vision, happened over the years when I kept hearing people saying about how amazing West Virginia is. The people would drive from Toronto, Canada to come to Morgantown to go climbing because the bouldering's really good for that grit stone. Or people coming from around to climb here. And I knew we had white water. I'm excited to show you the white water data for those of you who haven't seen it. So this had been festering in the back of my head for a really long time. Um, I like to say yes a lot. So there's my ice wall. Um, I started Adventure West Virginia as my graduate project. I'll tell you about that program. It now has 10 full-time full employees. It's the largest outdoor orientation program in the country. And I was told as a graduate student, Steve was on my graduate committee, Steve Stork, um, that uh, you would never get this started at the university. But I believed that it was something we needed to do. I'll share that data. We built an outdoor education center. It's about $2 million. Uh, it's up by Cooper's Rock. So I'll tell you about that a little bit, and then the, the $25 million gift and what we're trying to do with that. Um, flywheel uh, effect. So uh, I learned this from Brad Smith. If you can get momentum, so this is a flywheel on a train, and what it does is when the train goes down a hill, it starts storing that energy in that really heavy wheel. And so when it hits the flat, it can start to pull that energy back out. And so he talks about a flywheel, and he's hoping that our $25 million gift is just the start of that push to get people to think about, okay, there's something here, there's something happening here. And so that flywheel is um, what all of this is tied together. So how Adventure West Virginia led to our Science Adventure School, led to this office, the Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative, and the big wheel on the bottom right is the state of West Virginia. Can we use that flywheel energy to, to move the state forward? Uh, let me uh, talk about West Virginia. It's lost more population than any other state in the country over the last two censuses. The kids are gone, they've left, there's no jobs. Um, uh, Morgantown is within three hours of 15 million people in Cleveland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, DC. Um, when you look at the growth of the outdoor economy, Colorado grew at 30%, Utah at 29%, um, the states around West Virginia, Ohio grew at 10, uh, Kentucky 13, Virginia 16, Maryland 15, PA 16. West Virginia grew at 1%. We're 49th out of 50 states in the growth of the outdoor economy. Those of you that outdoor recreate know the assets that the state is sitting on. What that tells me is like, okay, here's an opportunity. We've, we can really accelerate. The only state we were better than was Louisiana that contracted, and Kansas grew at twice the rate of West Virginia for the outdoor economy. That was from 2012 to 2016. Um, and look at the, the, the offices out west. It's just amazing. So let me tell you about Adventure West Virginia. Um, so when I went to graduate school, I was originally going to do it on my graduate research on climbing wall accidents, and I 
kept getting the door shut on me. Nobody, oh, we never had closed calls. Are you like, you've ran a climbing wall for 15 years, you never had a closed call, no. So I started paying attention to outdoor orientation programs. And so looked at programs across the country and uh, Steve was on my graduate committee and uh, just said, well, there are eight schools coming to the state of West Virginia to run their outdoor orientation program. And uh, we're a land grant institution, why don't we have one? So as a graduate student running the climbing wall, because I had climbing skills, because I went to school here, and uh, so I wrote a letter to the president of the university and said, here's eight schools coming to West Virginia. Research, a lot of research out of the University of New Hampshire showed higher graduation rates, retention rates with students who go through the program. So I took this letter, it's two pages to the president's office, didn't know what to do, and just signed it, the graduate student at the climbing wall. So I gave it to the secretary, the secretary opened it, sent it down to the vice president of student life, who then sent it to the dean of students, who called the director of campus recreation. I was signing up a student named Ryan for the WVU's first Big Ben trip at the climbing wall. And my boss's boss uh, came and yelled at me and was like, get upstairs in five minutes. Who do you think you are? And I sat down on this couch and three people told me you would never get this program started at this institution. It has a black flag on it. Um, let this be a lesson to you, you don't go up. And I'm like, I wrote a letter to the president about this, this, this program. Um, I sat in that office for six years, by the way. That was my last office I had uh, pre-COVID. Um, so what I did was I, I just didn't give up because I believed in the opportunity for it. So that first year I had 14 students. Uh, I had 66 spots. I lost $2,000. But something really unique happened. I reached out to our medical advisor, the director of student health, who was looking for a proactive way to address alcohol issues on campus, because we were a number one party school for many years. And so I'm like, yeah, let's partner, let's do this. And so he came on the program, he's like, this was absolutely amazing. And September 23rd, 2003, while I was still in graduate school, I was told the next day that I have one year of funding to get the program going. Next year, I linked it with the freshman seminar program. I filled 144 spots in one week. I had no website, no brochure. Next year, still don't have a website and brochure. Filled 220 spots in a little over a week. Hired a second full-time person, built an outdoor education center, and now there's, there's 10 full-time people, and uh, I'll show you some of the data. Um, we run trips to Patagonia, Fiji. Uh, we've been done Peru, Costa Rica, um, New Zealand. Um, we are the first and only university with a canopy tour. So that's up at the University Forest. Uh, here's a picture of the Outdoor Education Center with our yurts. They're much more moldier than that now. That's a fresh <laughs> picture when we just put them up. Um, but one of the things I also did, this is the Dean Javier uh, Reyes, a former Dean of the Business School. So started partnering with the colleges. And so they, the deans have enrollment issues. How do they increase retention? How do they build community with the students? So I would get the deans out. This is the first time rafting. That's at Ohio Pile. And uh, he's like, this is amazing. And so I would just network out of student life to get this incredible support um, across campus. Uh, started teaching with my wife. This is not my wife. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is a student at Timberline. And, uh, uh, this is a student, Erin, I remember her name, she's a photographer, but we started teaching adventure travel writing and photography together. And uh, so that, that's the largest uh, degree program now in the College of Media where my wife's the chair of. And so just finding these partnerships all to get people outside. Um, so the OOPS design, why I think it's unique and I think it's so important, more schools do this, um, is that it's students' first experience in, in what's well, their transition of life. They're not a high school student and they're not a college student. They're at this really unique reflection point that they wanna be successful in college. They're scared, are they gonna be successful? They're worried about the, what it's gonna be like. Like, this is their first college experience. So their first college experience, there's no alcohol. We take away their cell phones for the week, so there's none of that pressure around it. So they're staying in a tent up to one o'clock at night laughing and telling stories. I can't tell you how many people have said they've got closer in one week than in people in their senior class they spent four years with because it's that sitting around a campfire, talking about college. Um, and I do think the importance of taking technology away is, is important for the parents and the students. So the parents aren't saying, Johnny or Susie, they're, they're getting up on their own, right? They're making it through this class and they're not worried about what their friends are doing on social media or anything they're in an experience that they're climbing in the state, 
they're rafting and they're just having the time of their life. Um, belongingness, Roy Braumeister is a, a researcher at, at, he was at Florida State, um, that says belongingness is a core human value. If a student doesn't belong, if they're sitting in the residence hall in the corner, they're not engaging with campus, they're not gonna retain. What the, the week-long program, backpacking and rock climbing, you have best friends walking into school that you have meaningful relationships. And also uh, addressing West Virginia stereotypes and, and showing off the state of West Virginia. Um, I'll show you a couple of these. You know what happens when people are climbing. This is Liz Stout climbing out at Cooper's. You know, the leadership. I think one of the things that's really important is that those, the venture programs are led by upperclassmen. So they're not led by old people like me. They're led by someone who's a sophomore, junior, or senior. So they can talk about what it was like living in the residence hall the previous year. But the importance of the trust, because the Blair on the other side is a student who's a year older than them or a few years older than them. And that's a really important aspect. But one of the things that really set our program apart, and I stole this from Rick Curtis at Princeton, Rick's a dear friend of mine, is the Leave a Trace program. And it's how do you leave a set of footprints for students to follow to be successful in school? And from the very first pilot, and again, I borrowed this from Rick, <laughs> Silicon Valley, they call it benchmarking according to Brad Smith. Um, but each night as we sit around the, the fire, as the trust within the group gets deeper, we start talking about, well, why did you choose WVU? What are you excited about? How is it different than high school to programs and resources or setting goals? to let's have a serious talk about alcohol issues and sexual assault and STIs. And then, um, and it's coming from other upperclassmen. And so that really differentiated our program. And so I'm also really proud that we've planted 30,000 plus red spruce trees, mostly in the national forest. And over, I will show you this picture. Um, this is one of our climbers restorations. From the very beginning, I felt like we were gonna negatively impact the environment. So we're taking people climbing all summer long out at Cooper's. So we do a climber's restoration, 140 people. You can see all the work we've done over the years to slow down the erosion, the soil compaction at the climbing sites. We've mulched the top of the cliffs to keep the trees alive. Um, but it was at this, uh, this restoration, I usually work at the table. We were feeding everybody when this picture was taken, by the way. Um, but you can see our canoe trailer with all the sticks that we gathered along the forest. But I, this group of climbers came out. And I said, oh, this is our adopt a crag with the access fund. And where are you guys from? And they said, Toronto, Canada. And they were like, it's our second week in a row driving to Morgantown to climb. And I'm like, really? Like, Morgantown? <laughs> Two weekends in a row from Toronto. And so again, that's feeding in the back of my head. Like, there's something here. We just need to tap into it. So I just want to share a little bit of the data. I'm not going to dive into this a ton. But every dollar invested in the adventure orientation program returns $10.60 back to the institution because six-year graduation rates go up so much. When we dive in here, I want to look at this low expected family contribution. If you're a student from a low-income family and you do this one-week program before college, your six-year graduation rate goes up 16%. Think about that. Their livelihood of like earning more money potential. Uh, if you are a first-generation college student, 10.5% increase, and if you're an underrepresented minority student, 12% increase. We've had seven peer-reviewed published articles on this program, and it's really linking um, kind of the freshman seminar in with outdoor orientation program, uh, and uh, really proud of it. So all of our programs, it's a $550 trip, it's $95 if you can afford it, and if you're a Pell Grant student, so low-income student, it's free. We've got boots and clothing, all to target them. And so really excited about the data. Um, and you know, when the institution looks at cutting budgets, they don't cut our budget because we have the data to back up the impact that it has on students. I, I will share this one with you. I think it's interesting. Dr. Brent Bell at the University of New Hampshire, he ran Harvard's program for eight years. Uh, he wanted to look at our reflection papers. And so this was a paper that students turned in the first week of school. Did the program help with their transition to college? If so, or if not, why or why not? Super open, and, and he calls me up, and he's, a, he's coding all these papers in SPSS. I'm not a researcher, by the way. I'm a programmer. I'm an outdoor educator. And so he ended up uh, coding. He's, he said, what are you doing to address alcohol issues? He didn't understand our Leave a Trace program. He ended up coding for it. 55% of the students unsolicitedly wrote about 
and alcohol discussion as being meaningful, as something that they were concerned about. When you dive in the class pedagogy, that we're sitting around a campfire, it was coming from upperclassmen instead of some high school teacher, that the trust within the group was really important, and being able to find people with shared values and views. So you can find somebody who's like, I didn't really party in high school, I'm not looking to party in college. You can find somebody uh, you can connect to. Of course, 83% of the papers talked about relationships, right? Friends they made on the program. But he kept coding and he kept hearing people write, this is the best experience of my life. And I, I have all of them coded, they're pretty cool to read through. Just the profound experiences that people had in this week, in their first week leaving. So 73% of the papers had life enriching experience. So all of that really gave the first wheel, the first energy at the university. I mean, WV was not taking advantage of the recreation scene that it had. It had an outdoor trips program, that was it. By the way, there was one full-time person in outdoor recreation at WVU. There are 38 people right now, 38 people. So STEM education, I did not study STEM. I'm an outdoor educator. So um, the Boy Scouts of America announced they're gonna build a $500 million camp in West Virginia. It's got five and a half miles of zip lines, largest outdoor climbing wall in the world, 32 miles of mountain bike trails built by Gravity Logic, acre and a half skate park at the time is the largest skate park in the US, the second largest skate park in the US, um, 280,000 square feet of BMX, four lakes, uh, they have an $8 million sustainable tree house, they have an $18 million footbridge, 85,000 person uh, earth and amphitheater, and it's in West Virginia. I'm like, sign me up, like what, how do we engage? This is an incredible opportunity for the state, kids from around the country. And so, as a university, I'm like, hey, this is a big deal, like this, a $500 million camp. By the way, it has one and a half times the bandwidth on site as the, as the largest city in the state. It was lit up by AT&T. So, incredible camp. 340 shower houses. It's crazy. So, um, we're in this room, former president of the university's ties to Charleston. I'm pulling all this research together and we have these incredibly brilliant physicists and researchers and they're like, well, we're gonna do STEM education. It's one of our pillars as an institution. And they're talking about robotics and they're talking about this other stuff. And I'm just sitting back there and I'm like, this isn't where it's at. Like, I wanna be out there on a zip line. Why aren't we teaching STEM and the science behind zip lining and the science behind climbing or uh, skateboarding or biking is where we should do it. So um, we reached out to them and they're like, yeah, do this. So we created the science behind the sport of bicycling. And so, or we did biking, uh, zip lining, climbing, uh, skateboarding, paddle sports and archery. Uh, Andrew Hoover uh, reports to me, he's incredibly brilliant. He's from Bridgeport, his master's degree in mechanical aerospace engineering. Uh, just an incredible individual. And uh, so here's what we do. We teach kids the math formula, and they're, these are local kids from uh, uh, Beckley area, uh, predicting how fast they'll go on the zip line. We use a little sock monkey here with weights, and they can test it. They can use radar guns to see how accurate they are. They get to go out on a canopy tour and have an experience. We wrote curriculum. Each tree we're in, each, we view each treehouse platform as a classroom, and then on the biggest zip, they actually, we get to shoot each other with the radar gun to see how accurate they are in their math prediction. So we're linking the STEM education into the outdoor experience. And so uh, we have really cool science behind cycling curriculum. And because the science behind cycling curriculum, uh, flywheel effect is what I'm gonna come back to. Because we had science behind the sport of bicycling curriculum, we started working with USA BMX because they have some STEM curriculum for elementary school kids. Our curriculum is written for kind of middle school, high school age. So the head of USA BMX Foundation was like, hey, have you heard of the Youth Cycling Coalition? And we're like, no, what is that? And it's 10 of the largest youth cycling organizations looking at one community in the country to get more kids on bikes and to, to make a positive impact. It's called a uh, social uh, impact model. Uh, social, uh, I forget it, social collaboration, it's out of Stanford. Anyways, there are 33 towns across the country, Ogden, Utah, Oakland, California, Charlotte, North Carolina, and out of all of them, these 10 organizations chose Morgantown as their pilot project. So we're working with them. We just got a donation from Rad Power Bikes, $60,000 to build a Project Bike Tech classroom. So now my son, when he goes to high school next year, can get certified as a bike technician in this $100,000 park bike tool 
uh, classroom in their learning STEM education. Uh, little Bellas, Rochelle's here, who's a graduate. Rochelle's awesome. We have doubled the number of girls on our NICA team in sixth grade. We have more young girls on our NICA team at sixth grade than boys because of Little Bellas, which is a female mentoring program for young girls in elementary school and middle school. NICA's growing. Um, we also have given away over 100 bicycles, and Project Bike Tech has only been out for six months. Um, uh, another big one. Yeah, that's good. So anyways, they chose Morgantown, and they're super excited to help us uh, build some collaborations there. So flywheel effect. Science Adventure School. I heard the folks down at the summit uh, say that they wanted every child in West Virginia to have multiple touch points with this facility. Again, incredible assets. It's sitting in some of the highest poverty rates in the country. It's sitting right next to the River Gorge National Park. It's ten, they have 14,000 acres, 10,600 acres on the main piece of property. So I'm like, sign me up. So we started doing research, looking at science schools across the country, really like McCall Outdoor Science School, University of Idaho's program. And how could we work with local kids to get them out learning environmental education, STEM education, and uh, adventure activities to build the confidence. It's basically, uh, Adventure West Virginia for sixth graders at the beginning of the school with the teachers. The principal, Johan Smith at uh, Beckley Stratton, said it's transformed his school. It's addressed bullying. The teacher said it's transforming the classroom because now they know why Johnny is listening. He just might be fidgeting a lot. And they have these incredible relationships with the kids. So these are all local kids, um, you know, from, from West Virginia getting this STEM experience. And so far, with the Science Adventure School, we've raised $3.6 million. We're working with Brad Smith to go after $35 million to have every child in the state go through it. Because if we're gonna ignite the outdoor economy, we have to show them like, it's really special to have 3,500 climbing routes at the New River Gorge and to have 890 miles of white water within an hour and a half drive of uh, Fayetteville. Like, you live in an outdoor Mecca, but they never had a chance. I just went climbing. I stopped down there. I was coming back from uh, uh, Tennessee a, about a month ago, and there's this little boy, and he's sitting there, and he has a, I don't know if it was, he wasn't talking to anybody. He has this birthmark around his eye, big red kind of birthmark there, and all the other kids were talking. He's sitting there, and I'm like, hey, why don't you, you go climbing? And he's like, oh, I've already done it once. I'm good. And I'm like, I'll climb if uh, you climb. And he looks at me, kind of like, old man, sure. You're gonna climb. And uh, I said, he's like, okay. So he gets up and he, he walks up and he's like, well, what do I get if I climb up higher than you? And I said, I don't know, what do you think? He's like, how about $5? I'm like, okay. And, but then part of my, uh, like, should I do that? Is that wrong? And so I'm like, well, what if I climb higher? I want a snack from the snack bag over there, which they had a snack bag for all the kids. So he climbs up as his second climb ever. He's from Beckley and his little legs were shaking and he was nervous and as he got closer to the top, I'm like, oh, you need to come down, you're too high. And he's like, oh, I'm making it. And he makes it to the top and he comes down, I give him a high five and then he watches me climb up and I climb higher than him because I didn't want to give him $5. And I touch the, <laughs> touch the shuts and I come back down. Oh, oh, and before I climb, sorry, I missed uh, one piece. I said, do you have any advice for me before I climb? And he said, believe in yourself. It's really sweet. So we come down, I'm talking with them, I'm eating my snack, and, uh, and the, the, the folks were like, last climb, and he's like, oh, hold on, I'm gonna go climb one more time. So he went over and climbed one more time. As we were walking out with his school teacher, she's like, yeah, he's really quiet, and he's like, I really like climbing. I'm like, you live in an outdoor Mecca? You've got you know, all these climbs, and so we were talking with her about getting the, the principal to pay. There's a climbing gym in Beckley, it's small, but how do we get the kids over there to climb? And then the summit is gonna offer each of them, the kids be able to come back and come on site, have a free day pass, if he can bring his brothers and sisters to climb. So just trying to find these little moments, but it's, we're working with the park service, by the way, uh, which is pretty inspiring uh, to get them down on the new river. They're doing macro invertebrates, looking at the stream health, and the park service is paying for it because they're like, this is our mission, and we've got to connect. And so it's been really inspiring to watch local kids connect with the national park that's in their backyard. And we've got some incredible data, I won't, won't talk about it. Um, so again, building momentum, STEM education. When I met Brad Smith, he really linked on to the Science Venture School idea too, by the way. So the Outdoor Education, uh, Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative. So in 2018, 
uh, the year Bryce and I backpacked the Grand Canyon rim to rim, I came off a bad bout, bout with uh, cancer. And uh, the president of the university is like, look, you can't run the campus recreation and adventure anymore. He's like, we, I redid the, the rec center. We have a $35 million recreation center. We have a great director there and adventure. He's like, you can't have that stress you know, with, with your health issues. So he went, wanted me to focus on this initiative with Science Adventure School and the BSA. And I said, can I write the outdoor economy into my job description? He's like, yeah. I'm like, sweet. And so I wrote, I've written every job description I've ever had at WVU because the, the positions never existed. And uh, so I wrote it in there. So I go, um, so I'm just collecting data, right? And so I want to I show you some of the, 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 the data. Let me see what this one is. So 2019, this is the president of the university. By the way, President Gee has signed more diplomas than anybody in the history of higher education. He was president at Colorado, Vanderbilt, Brown, Ohio State for 14 years, WVU. He's all about making a difference in the state. So this is the World Jamboree and the president of our university. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. There were people from around the world getting along, countries that were at war with each other, getting together. It was absolutely 44,000 people. And then the same year, the World Cup is at Snowshoe in West Virginia. I'm like, oh, this is the, this is the start of that wheel, right? So the world's coming here. They're out there recreating. Uh, they're seeing the state of West Virginia. And so I, uh, uh, that following spring, I went to Bentonville to Trail Labs. This is Rich Edwards. He created Emba Trail Solutions, the whole trail building arm. He's now on our staff. This is Danny Twilley. He was presenting at uh, Invitrell Labs. He's now on our staff. Um, and then there's another person, Andy Williamson. This is above the, the very first Walmart where I'm like, come here. This is what we want to do. Our office started with a blank piece of paper. And within six months of the start of it, had $25 million. So just think about that. Blank idea, whether it's a climbing wall, you can take ideas and take them and move them forward uh, with, with some crazy action. So data. So I needed data. Like I kept hearing people talk about what we had. I worked with a young girl. She was a senior recreation student who was a climber. And I'm like, I want to know where climbing gyms are going. So we looked at all the climbing gyms within kind of a three hour radius. And we also included Philadelphia because an article about Philadelphia is so hot because all the climbing gyms there. So we added Philadelphia. Most of them, if they travel, they do come to West Virginia. There's one spot in Maryland, what, I don't even know what it is, uh, right around in here that they climb at. But most of them come to West Virginia to go climbing when they do trips. Um, Andy, do you know what it is? OK, yeah. So that was a really popular spot. But most of them, if they traveled, they came to the state of West Virginia. So then I kept hearing, there was a, there was a doctor, Dr. Jack did. He moved to Asheville and was like, Hey, Morgantown's got way better access to Whitewater than Asheville. I'm like, Asheville's really cool, really? It's got this great outdoor scene. So we started looking at it. So these are the Whitewater runs, and you guys know this. You guys are actually more in the center than we are in Morgantown. Uh, these are the Whitewater runs within an hour drive. What I love is that there's class one, two, three, four, five plus, right? The whole gamut is there. So then we're like, well, let's take every Whitewater one on American Whitewater, and let's do this for Morgantown. So in order to do Morgantown, we had to PA and Maryland. And so we're like, wow, look at that cluster. So what does this look like if we pulled every one of them in? And so we're like, wow, look at how thick that cluster is over West Virginia. So we started meeting with our GIS faculty members. And here's what it looks like. This is every white water run in America showing the greatest density. So if there's another white water run within a 50 mile radius, bumps it up. So if there's another one, bumps it up. And this graphic right here has turned more heads. Even in the state legislature, John Chambers, former CEO of, of Cisco, and they're building the internet. When he saw this, he's like, holds his hands up. He's like, sustainable competitive advantage for the state from a business perspective. So we have, I mean, you, know, you can read this, five times greater the whitewater density of Colorado, Utah, Montana, Arizona, and Texas. So it's one thing to have density, but how much does it run? So we're getting wetter with climate change, and the West is getting drier. So we funded a graduate student to work with Dr. Nicholas Zegg, who's a forest hydrologist, look at 10 years of climate data, and so from here, <coughs> excuse me, 
So we looked at the minimum, minimum runnable level on American Whitewater and wanted to look at the total number of days that it's runnable. So we then ran that, uh, we're doing it for 150 of the top Whitewater runs uh, in America. So let's look at the Big Sandy. So it runs 48% of the year, so taking a 10-year average. Upper Yawk, 205 days, 56% of the year. Uh, Cheat Narrows, Rollsburg is really an economically distressed area, 77% of the year, it's runnable. Lower Yawk, 100% of the year. 100%, you can kayak every single day. So if you can't kayak, go climbing. Uh, so again, trying to tell a different story. So give you a distance in, in density. So Morgantown, so let me go back. Boise, Idaho, Whitewater Town, Great Whitewater Park, hour and a half drive, they have 98 miles of whitewater. Boulder, Colorado has 122. Morgantown is 605. Beckley is 820. Elkins has 875. Fayetteville has 890 and 3,500 road climbs in a half an hour drive. And Thomas and Davis actually has 1,102, more than any other outdoor town we can find in the whole United States. Competitive advantage, telling a different story. Uh, here's all the total number of runnable days uh, for all the runs within an hour drive, so you can look at them and we've, we've analyzed those. Some of those runs hardly ever run, um, but uh, it's all there. So using data to tell a different story to create momentum. So let me show you what our vision was. So I don't, so when we met Brad Smith, um, funny story, I, I, I've been told no a lot. Um, so John Kasich, former presidential candidate from Ohio, two-term governor, really turned their economy around, was good friends with President Guy at WVU because he was president at, at Ohio University for 14 years. And, and, and John Kasich's there. So I shared this idea of using remote workers to come to the state to show I want outdoor people, I want more people with racks on their cars or boats or bikes to get more people that care about the environment and understand and you know, help drive the economy. And on that call, he's like, that's the dumbest idea. Governments, you don't invest in people, you invest in corporations is what I heard. And uh, so, Got off the call, got off the Zoom, and I'm like, okay. Brad Smith had given me his card. I didn't know who he was, really. <laughs> and uh, I knew he was that into it, and he was some CEO, but I should have done my research, but I didn't. But that's probably a good thing. And so I texted him and was like, hey, um, you know, you want to hear this idea? And he said, absolutely. And so from day one, we shared this vision that we would have a two-year program that we want outdoor recreation people to come to the state that are remote workers. We would pay them $12,000, $10,000 over the first year in monthly payments, and $2,000 if they stay through year two. And the thought is, if they stay through two years, they've got belongingness, connections with the state, um, they get a free outdoor recreation package. So we actually can take them whitewater rafting, take them climbing, the co-working space we're building right next to the Morgantown Brewing Company down on the rail trail. We have kayaks and bikes and there's an outdoor gear shop right up the road, right Gabe? And uh, we're really central because we're trying to, to be, get them outside, but we took them to Snowshoe for four days, fully paid for from Brad Smith, to show them the mountains, to take them mountain biking, we take them climbing, we get them out, they can grab paddle boards anytime they want, they go to the local gym, Gritstone, and uh, trying to build community and belongingness because Brad said if, if the workers are here, the companies will follow. We're losing more population in the other state and I believe that if you get out and you see how amazing the state is, that, that you'll retain. And so um, we also in that, we have $16 million for recreation infrastructure. So Rich Edwards who created InBetrail Solutions is on our staff overseeing the construction. So how do we lower the barrier of trails? We're building right now, today, there's construction going on, on a trail specifically for Rochelle, who's a graduate of this program, for Little Bellas in the spring, and that's why it's being built now, so that it's fully ready for when Little Bellas rolls up in the spring, so we've got a lower barrier of entry of trails. We just did a ribbon cutting on the 27th of September for our first gravity um, trails in Morgantown, so super flowy gravity trails, 
and we're doing eight to 10 miles this coming year of high quality trails, and we're just gonna keep upping the bar so that each year, because if we build a really good trail right now, and we don't build one that good, they'll go like, but that's not as good as the one you built last year. So each year, the plan is to keep upping the quality of trails, and our goal is to build a trail within a mile of every resident in Morgantown. And then how do we do this in other communities around the state? We just had a trail conference uh, down at Snowshoe Thursday and Friday last week, educating the communities around what modern trails are. Uh, it isn't just about old forest roads that are eroded. Those, those are fun, I love them. And uh, snowshoe's really rocky, but there's also um, uh, trails that are um, uh, easier and flowier. And then uh, lastly, I wanna end with this. When we were creating this office and there was a blank piece of paper, I'm like, I see a pyramid, and I drew the pyramid up, and at the bottom of that pyramid are like rail trails and flat water paddling and climbing gyms, and the top of that is, is Jesse paddling <laughs> the black water and you know these really hard sections. And when you think about the beauty of our state, these are all pictures in West Virginia, there's Bryce, my son, um, we have it all. And if you think about the number of participants, as we think about trails and lowering the barrier of entry so we can get more people in, so they can advance up, uh, that we're really spending a lot of time focusing on the bottom area and lowering the difficulty. I remember, Steve, you said something uh, one time about the, the extreme sport videos doing a disservice to the industry. And I think it's true because they see people going off the waterfalls and incredible athletes, I mean, what Dane Jackson does is just phenomenal. But it scares people, like that's why water kayaking, like no, you can paddle, you know, Hopeville Canyon outside Seneca, that's just a great class two, three section. And so how do we educate and show people that they can get out? And I think from an economic development side, the more we can spend time down in here, the greater number of people, because people up here already know we're here. They know the climbing, the hard climbing's there. It's, where are the easy climbs? How do we get the kid from Beckley to understand that that 5.5 he just climbed is awesome, and that's in the National Park, and that's great you're able to do that. And, and so I just wanted to share that model with you. And so here's our master plan. Oh, ooh. Prezi, sorry. Wow, it did this earlier. Uh, okay, it's not gonna, go. Um, I will just say that there's a master plan to tie university properties, so we're actually protecting the farms and the green space in town, which is pretty significant, and the dean of the college realizes it, and we just took a 180-acre piece of property that's right next to Mon General Hospital. Trails are on it, parking lot's full, and all the farms are about it because they realize they have this incredibly valuable farm there's no reason why they couldn't do that research out in Preston County. And so they are like, yeah, we can move fences. Can you tell the story of what we do here? We're like, yes, absolutely. So we want to tie all of Morgantown with high quality mountain bike trails. And then how do we protect other areas? There's a lot of climbing on private land that we need to protect and uh, hopefully open up some access that people chopped all the bolts to woodlands. A uh, great place to sport climb at one point. So. Um, it's all about, let's see what I have here. Um, it's all about momentum and flywheel. So you can see how, how all these things fit in to changing a state. And I truly believe that in 20 years that we will look back as this is a, a time frame where the state legislature is seeing it, that we're getting earmarks. I mean, the Senator Manchin's office is reaching out about earmarks for recreation infrastructure. So they're thinking that way all through data. And so it all started here with a little ice climbing wall. So um, questions or, or thoughts there? Yeah. Colorado has more mines than West Virginia. And uh, how does mining and extraction fit in with this? Um, and, and so we had other people. Utah and Colorado have huge mining industries. And they also have some of the largest outdoor economies, so I think they can continue to exist. But they, people also have to understand that there, there's real money. You know, the outdoor economy is 887, don't quote me on the exact number, 800, $800 billion dollar industry 
in the United States. And so there's real money to be had. So, yeah. The new economy work group for the state legislature, when they saw this presentation and the data, they said this was the best idea. Best presentation they had ever seen. They, I don't think they'd seen Prezi. <laughs> and, uh, but they said the best idea for the future of the state. And that's coming from our legislature. So it's pretty powerful. Yeah. I apologize if I missed this, but uh, why did you come to Garrett College? So I was at Fairmont State, struggling with marketing management, working at Walmart, paying my way through school. And uh, in 96, I went, uh, traveled cross country uh, two and a half months on $700 and backpacked 400 miles. And so when I went back to Fairmont, I started, uh, they had an outdoor class, so I signed up and the person knew nothing about the outdoors. He was a football coach. And uh, so I said, I just got off this trip. I've backpacked all over the place. So I started teaching. And uh, my last semester there, while I was taking 15 hours of marketing management, I was teaching seven credit hours. I organized 20 students to go to the Grand Canyon to backpack because I was president of the Outdoor Adventure Club and they paid 125 bucks for that trip. And then there were two of those sections of outdoor class and I'm like, I need to go into outdoor ed. And this, this program, I came here, I was here for a year, but it truly gave me the foundation. I never knew what risk management was. I didn't know how to kayak. How did you learn about it? How did you, you learn I don't remember. It? Don't remember, but my parents were not happy that I was dropping out of my double major in business to study adventure sports, but it was the best thing I could have done because that gave me the pathway because that's where the energy, I didn't want to be in a business. Like that's, even though I'm doing business stuff, I'm raising money, I'm running a lot of budgets. But um, yeah, that was, it was really the foundation. And by the way, when I was here on the weekends, when I wasn't in class, I was paddling on the yacht. I was out, Jason was at the house jumping off my roof on a snowboard. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we were, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Yeah. This might be a bigger thing of words, but with, at least in my case, this is a long time ago, there was a reciprocity with Gary Collins and Doug Beasley. And obviously at that point in time, this was the adventure program here, didn't exist at WVU, and maybe it was just in the infancy stages. But, you know, Gary College can only pull from so many resources. Yep. I wanted it. What I love about this program is the technical skills. I mean, there were a bunch of graduates. I'm like, hey, come to graduate school. Come get your degree, because that's one of the things that's missing at WVU is that we're not teaching the technical skills. I just heard a story, I think it was Thursday on West Virginia Public Broadcasting, uh, about the need for people in the hospitality and the tourism industry with the right skill set. I mean, I, I would argue that um, uh, even the rafting industry at the new, as mature as it is, it needs people that are really skilled um, to, to manage and, and be there. And we don't have it. We don't have it at, at WVU at all. I'd love that. I actually had that conversation. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. Their life years ahead of them once it started up. Yep. So how do you use the skills so that they do get to look at as competition? I was working on it quite a bit in 2012, 2013 with the reciprocity. I was trying to get it going. Because I'm like, yes, like, but that's when Frostburg started to, you know, it's in state. I get it. You know, I'd rather be in Morgantown. It's better climbing. <laughs> So yeah, it's going, but it's small. We set up yeah. to be a reciprocity with this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have that. Yep. So, this place is an outdoor mecca. And even up here, this is, you guys are way more in the center of Whitewater than Morgantown. And you have a ski resort. Well, we, we all know that uh, the uh, assets that allow us to do the things we do 
had recreation. They know no political boundaries. Mm -hmm. They're just geographical boundaries. And yep. So working with uh, local uh, you know, uh, officials in, in terms of getting something accomplished, there's, a, there's always that boundary or that, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> that uh, challenge yep. that exists because, oh no, you're, you're in Garrett County. Yep. You, you, know, you can't work with uh, Mom and Gailey. Yep. They're over in West Virginia. Well, that's but, why if you look at our assets, what we talk about, it goes across the borders. It doesn't matter to me if Ohio Piles in Pennsylvania. It's an hour drive from Morgantown. So that's why when you look at when we started doing the data, we didn't say, oh, this is all we have. It would be leaving so much out, right? And, and even for here, you guys come over to Morgantown to climb, and oh, yeah. we come here to ski, and it's from the outdoor community, it doesn't, there are, the boundaries right. aren't there. From politicians, there are. They don't take a regional approach. It's a, it's a yep. challenge. Yeah. 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 Do you have any uh, work with the uh, juvenile services in West Virginia? Kind of we don't. I'll tell you, it's a lot of work with the sixth graders. Yeah. Um, we're running about 1,300 sixth graders. So they'll be out at climbing at Cooper's next week, Wednesday and Thursday. And, uh, and uh, if you know any of the students, too, that want help integrating, you know, whether that's coming and working with Adventure um, or working at our Outdoor Education Center, um, you know, it's right up the road. So trying to do something. We'll see where it goes. I do. We did meet with uh, the, the, the founder of Colorado's Office of Outdoor Recreation, and he said, you guys are so much ahead of us. I'm like, excuse me? Like, what do you mean? He's like, we created an Office of Outdoor Recreation because we had a multi-billion dollar industry that we had nobody in government that was even paying attention to it. Where we don't have that, we're 49th out of 50th, so we're trying to do it and trying to do it right. We're gonna screw up, we're gonna mess up, but I, I do believe that people are listening and I hope that we, we turn around the economy and we get to keep the kids in the state and prove the, the livelihood. I, I think it's coming, so we'll see. So thank you all. It's a pleasure to be up here as always. Well, I'd like to say that uh, it's really a, a testament to our program mm -hmm. uh, that uh, somebody like yourself has, uh, has done what you've done. Thank I you. I appreciate that very much. Yep. Thanks. A lot of fun. Thank you, Thank you all.